Good evening, and welcome to Allen's Italy. Um, the new Allen is what you're looking at. This is the Allen without glasses. Um, over the past four weeks, I've been experiencing uh, cataract surgery. I had one eye done on June 14th, and I had the other eye done on July 8th. And um, it's now, hopefully, all behind me. And I now have uh, extraordinary vision, way different from what I used to have. Um, I, I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just going to say that, um, you know, I, I spoke to dozens of people about it uh, to find out what it was all about, and I did a lot of research. The research was good because I knew what, what was coming, but, you know, asking all these people for their opinion on, um, on what would happen and what happened to them was a complete waste of time, in my opinion. And I, I spent hours upon hours speaking, of people, speaking to people and finding out what they were experiencing. And it just, it's just so different for every person that it's impossible to tell. I will say that the, the, the operation it's, it's itself were, were painless. Um, you're up during it, you know, you're not completely sedated. You, you're sedated, but you're not anesthetized to the point that you're out. So you do experience what's happening. But it's an amazing thing, and the recovery period is very short, and there's some inconvenience, but basically, um, if I got through it, I believe that anybody can get through it. So uh, that's that. And we now go into uh, a different phase of the program because um, we were in Italy uh, at the end of May, beginning of June. And of course, you know, we go to Italy to enjoy our friends and so on, but we also go with, with the express purpose in mind of coming up with new material that I could then use on the show and, you know, for the coming year. Um, I have a lot of new stuff, a lot of good, very, very good stuff. I'll be discussing some of it this evening and over, you know, the course of the next um, several months. Let me go to the album for tonight. It's been so long since I've done a show, I have to um, remember what I used to do. This is full screen, I suppose. It looks like full screen. Okay, there it is. That's, that's really what I want. The theme of the show is uh, show number 123, my favorite bridges. This is not, again, this is not all the bridges in Italy. Um, I, I could never possibly come close to giving you every bridge in Italy, but these are the favorite ones that I've come across during the time that I've been, you know, I've spent in Italy of almost, you know, 25 years. So that's gonna be the theme. But a couple of things, first of all, while the show was off the air, people were nonetheless going to the show on YouTube. So I have now 125 subscribers. Um, we're, we're approaching 37,000 views on YouTube. This is my blog that you're looking at now, and um, it, it has had over 10,000 page views. This is a, a little, this is a few weeks old, so it's really uh, over, um, way over 10,000 uh, page views. And I, you know, I haven't been writing too much, except things about my cataract surgery, which some people really have found interesting because people have been going to it, you know, and I've been talking about that in a very frank way. But I, and I spoke a little bit about my trip, you know, to Italy, so I did that. But, you know, there's a, uh, there's a following of people that go to the show on YouTube, that read the blog, and send me emails and so on, and, you know, that's pretty much the audience. Now, you know, th this trip really um, epitomized my whole traveling to Italy experience. And, you know, why do we go to Italy every year? 
And I've narrowed it down pretty much to uh, three things. You can see it right there. Um, our wonderful friends and their families, the most extraordinary food that uh, we, we ever ate, just unbelievable food, and of course, fabulous scenery. So I'm going to focus a little bit on each of those things uh, this evening. First, the actual trip, which you know, began on May 26th, and um, we were home on June 6th. You know, we had to squeeze in a trip to Italy around me ending my college teaching, which was only on May 24th that I finished. And then um, uh, Laura was in um, an exhibition in upstate New York where we had to get her work. And then, of course, I had my cataract surgery to plan so that I would be able to spend time recovering and so on. So I'm using all of, all of my summer for all the things we had in mind. But we managed to somehow take a 10-night trip to uh, Siena, Florence, and Orvieto. And I put in parentheses Civita di Bonareggio because uh, we were in Orvieto predominantly to visit with our friend Franco, who owns the restaurant in Civita di Bonareggio. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next uh, few minutes. So, you know, in, in Florence, actually Lydia came to Siena to pick us up and drive us all around. But, you know, here are some photographs of the, of the, in my opinion, the main reason we go to Italy. And this is, uh, you know, Lydia is, of course, on the right, and um, her sister Chiara is in the center, and Chiara's son, Jacopo, is um, on the left side of, of the photograph. And everybody is just wonderful to us. And Jacopo, the week after, was going to uh, have his uh, first communion. So the, the family was very, very excited about that. We didn't get to see the whole family. We only got to see Jacopo, Chiara, and, and Lydia. So it was a little disappointing, but still it was a, a lot of fun. And then, of course, um, someone whom Lydia introduced me to is the lady in the middle, and that's Sabrina, and her husband, Giulio, and her son, Simone. And we spent uh, a couple of days with them. And uh, we traveled around Tuscany. I'll talk about that a little more in a few minutes. And her husband, Giulio, is a chef at one of the most famous hotels in Florence, the Westin Excelsior. And he cooked us a lunch, which literally began at 2 in the afternoon and ended at 5 in the evening. And you know, it was just multi-course meal with everything. It was an amazing thing. And, um, and, then, and then, of course, they mentioned to us that they know this in incredible pizza place in Florence. And we, were, we had no plans for the next evening. So they took us to this amazing place in Florence where we had very, very good pizza. And uh, while we were there, Giulio um, immediately invited us next year to come to the house and said, what would you like next year? So, you know, just wonderful, wonderful people. And then, of course, we spent time with um, our friend, my old friend, Luca, who's not old at all, as you could see, and his daughter, Greta. And uh, the three of us, and Laura, of course, took a trip to an area that I had wanted to go to for many years, the Val d'Orcia area, which I'll talk about in, in, in a future show. But we had just a wonderful time, the four of us, traveling around uh, Tuscany. And you know, we met Greta, um, I think it was 2008, which was you know, eight years ago. She was, you know, of course, much, much younger. She's a wonderful, wonderful uh, person. You know, we were, Greta and I were in the back of the car with, with Luca driving and Lydia in the front seat. And Greta is such a sweet, wonderful person. You know, we kept getting in and out of the car because we were always telling Luca to, you know, to stop. We wanted to take a picture and we went, you know, we, we, we went to, to lunch and we were constantly in and out of the car. Every time I got back into the car, I was fumbling around for the seatbelt and Greta would, would be focusing on what I was doing. And I kept wondering, you know, but she wanted to know if, you know, if I was, she kept saying to me, do you need help with your seatbelt? Because she saw I was having a little difficult. 
She's such a wonderful person. So that was a really wonderful day we spent traveling around Tuscany with Greta and Luca. And then, of course, we went to Orvieto, where we spent time with our friend Franco. He is the person right next to, to, uh, uh, to Laura on the, uh, you know, it's Laura, Lu uh, Franco, and Nina, and, uh, and me over there on the right side. And uh, he, he first took us out to dinner in Orvieto the night before, and then the, and then the next day, which is this day that this photograph was taken, we spent the day literally in the town of Civita di Banareggio, mostly in his restaurant. And we had just this wonderful restaurant experience. Laura was taking videos of his cooking. So we have 20 minutes of video of Franco in the kitchen cooking for probably 50 to 60 people that came to his restaurant that Sunday afternoon. Um, you know, it was really June 5th. So that was an amazing, and I was, I was outside, I was in the, at our table waiting for the food to come out, and I was watching what was going on in the restaurant. It was a fascinating experience, which of course will be a future show. So, you know, that was uh, Franco and Nina, wonderful, wonderful people. That's the town of Civita di Banareggio, an amazing town which I'll focus on. It, this is actually the next show I'll be doing, is to talk a lot about this town. And this town was actually the focal point of, this, of the fourth show I ever did back in very early 2012. And the name of the show that I'll be doing next time will be uh, Return to Civita. So that'll be really nice. And I have some wonderful videos this is another reason we, you know, love going to Florence, and this is Roger Crum, Professor Roger Crum, who's professor of uh, art history at the University of Dayton in Ohio, who's a wonderful person, and you know, Luca and I like to have this friendly argument about who knows more about Florence, you know, Luca or, or I, and frankly, you know, Luca was born there, so he knows more than I do. But this fellow, Roger, probably knows more than the two of us put together. He is a genius on the city of Florence. And we had a very nice time spending, um, when we went to the restaurant in Florence, La Spada, he was there every night. Because he, he brings groups of students from the United States, and he shows them around and gives them projects in Florence. So he came to this restaurant uh, each night, and we always met him there. He came with the students, and you know, the, the owner of the restaurant, Giuseppe and, and Agostino, the owners, would serve his, uh, this time there were 50 students. So they used to come and have dinner there every evening, and we would bump into Roger, and then spend the rest of the evening with him. And that was a really wonderful experience. And then, the day we left, on June 6th, uh, no, excuse me, we left Florence, I believe, on May 31st to go to, no, it wasn't May 31st. It was June 4th. I'm having trouble because it was quite a while ago, but it, on June 4th, we left Florence on a train to go to Orvieto. And this was uh, a real surprise because Roger met us. We were on the train, and he comes by and said, hi, I came to say good goodbye to you. And I don't even know how he knew what train we were on, but here he is, and the sign he's holding up says La Spada. That was the restaurant, of course, where we met. And this is a photograph that Laura took, an amazing photograph. I'll tell you why. Um, what's going on is that I'm having a conversation with Roger. I'm on, I'm on the steps of the, of the train, uh, which is about to leave any minute, and Roger and I are having a conversation, and suddenly, as you can see, he turns to his right as if he's listening, and tells me to stop talking for a minute because he was listening to the announcement over the public address system. And what the announcement was saying was, this train is currently out of order and everybody has to move to another train. And we had gotten there very early, we got a great seat, and um, all of a sudden, Roger said, you have to move to the next train. He ran up the steps, ran to our luggage, grabbed all of our luggage from the overhead rack, and ran down the, the, the platform with Laura and I in, in tow. 
with Laura and me in tow, took us to the next train that we were supposed to board, and we boarded the train, and then he bid us farewell, and off we went to our next destination, which was Orvieto. So that's what, you know, this is a wonderful, wonderful man, and, you know, it was, it's always a pleasure going to Florence and bumping into him. And, of course, the food was amazing. These are two dishes that were both cooked by Franco in his restaurant. And we'll talk more about the food um, in a future show. But these are two dishes that he cooked for us. Unbelievable. The pasta, incidentally, is a type of pasta they have in this region of Italy known as peachy. So this, this is peachy with various sauces, which I'll talk about. And, of course, we had the experience of seeing some amazing scenery. And uh, this is uh, Tuscany, and that's a beautiful Tuscan view. That's a restaurant over there on the right with the view of Tuscany in the distance. And of course, this is the hotel in Florence with a panoramic view of the view you get from the roof of the hotel in Florence. Unbelievable. I mean, you know, you have a Prosecco up there as we do very often with this view in the background. It's just really amazing. And that's the reason why, those are the reasons why we go to Italy every year. And we'd like to uh, bid a quick thank you to all the people that made this trip such a wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful vacation. To Lydia, Luca, Greta, Sabrina, Giulio, Simone, Roger, Chiara, Jacopo, Franco, and Nina, we say thank you very, very much. Now, you'd think that a person who's been to Florence 22 times like myself would have seen everything there is to see. But it's not true, because these are some of the things that I saw in Florence that were new and different. And I made, um, we took photographs of all the things that we came across that filled that, filled that category. So first of all, this is a, a device that, that blocks traffic, and it comes up from the ground, um, and of course cars cannot get past here. I've never seen this in Florence. I've seen this in other parts of Italy, but I've never seen this in Florence, and this is a street that is blocked off, and you know, if you have special permission to go down the street in Florence, you get out of your car and there's a button you press, and I guess there's a certain code, and that thing goes down, and you're allowed to go over it. Now, the only time I ever really, I saw this a few times, the only time I ever had to deal with it in a car was in the town of Perugia, which was uh, many years ago. So this was new and different. The line outside the cathedral to get in was the longest line I've ever seen. It, you know, this is only the very, you know, this is approaching the front door of the cathedral, but the line actually extended probably several hundred meters uh, down the Piazza del Duomo. I've never seen this. So this, there were so many people in Florence that this is uh, of the line outside the cathedral. Usually you go to the cathedral, you just walk right in. But these people were online. I don't know how long they waited. These, this is a very interesting line because these are the people who were online to get into the Galleria Academia to see Michelangelo's David. Now, usually there's a line, and the line is, is usually forms on the other side. So it's a good idea to get a reservation, what's called in Italy a prenotazione. This is the reservation line. Not only was the regular line unbelievably long, but even the reservation line, which, was, which usually allows you to go into the museum extremely quickly, maybe 10 minutes, was a line that did not seem to ever end. So Florence was just unbelievably crowded. This is a museum that I've never been to, uh, or, nor Laura has ever been to. It's the Natural History Museum, which we went to because a friend of ours was displaying his art. And you know, it's, uh, you know, it's like the Museum of Natural History um, in Manhattan. It's, you know, dinosaur uh, bones, which were put together. And it's really a magnificent museum. And as you can see, this museum is almost devoid of people. 
Um, I would say in the, in the uh, basically half hour to 45 minutes we were in this museum, we saw nobody. So this is an amazing place. I've never been to this museum. Okay, so here's the story behind this. This is one of the, it's called a chanakalo, which is a Last Supper. And of course the most famous Last Supper is the one by Leonardo da Vinci, which is in Milan at the um, church of, of Santa della Grazie. Um, but this is one, this is the Last Supper, one of the Last Suppers of uh, Ghirlandaio, one of my favorite, or well, my favorite artist. And this is the one that's in the church of Onisante. And it's a beautiful, beautiful painting. And I've seen it many, many times. This is another of his Last Suppers, which appears in the Museum of San Marco. Now, usually, or I would say probably all the time, when Renaissance artists painted a Last Supper, it was always in what, what used to be in the 15th century, it was called a refectory. In the refectory, the monks would have their meals. So they would let, you know, this was the picture that was on the wall. It was a fresco that was painted right onto the wall, and the monks would actually dine you know, with a constant reminder of the Last Supper um, with uh, Jesus right in the middle and the person right in front of the, uh, of the table is actually Judas. And that usually is the theme of all the Last Suppers. And, you know, it, and this, this, this particular Last Supper actually, you know, was in the refectory but is now uh, the gift store at the Church of San Marco. And people just basically walk past it. And as you can see, it's just a magnificent, a magnificent piece of art. But there's a third Last Supper. And I never saw it. And that, you know, for a Ghirlandaio fan, that's very hard. And I knew it was somewhere in Tuscany. And it was Sabrina and Lydia, mostly Sabrina, who told us that Ghirlandaio's third Last Supper appears in the town of Badia Apasignano, which is where we were last year during 2015. I actually did a show on Badia Apasignano. But this, paint, this uh, fresco has been under restoration for 10 years, and it was just open to the public. And Sabrina made, made it a point to call the person in charge of the monastery of Badia Apasignano to get special permission for us to go and to see Ghirlandaio's uh, Last Supper that we I had never seen. So this is what you're looking at now. And I can honestly say that I've now seen all three of Ghirlandaio's Last Suppers. So that was quite new and different for me as well. There's a store I've never seen before, a 99 cent store. And it sort of says that it's a discount store underneath it, as you could see. But it's, you know, the top part is in English, called a 99 cent store, just as we would see in the United States. So that was unique for me. The restaurant and um, store Italy, which, you know, those of you who live in New York City, I don't know if there are Italy's in other places around the country, but uh, New York City has a, a very large one in Midtown Manhattan. But this is the first one that I have ever seen in Florence. And we spoke to that fellow right in front there who was a waiter, and he knew all about it and said that it's only been there for a few months. So once again, something I've never seen before in Italy, and Italy, which I heard has very, very good food. And this is you know, one of the one of the very uh, somber views uh, in Italy, and that is a, a member of the uh, Italian army patrolling some of the major tourist locations uh, to kind of watch out for terrorism. And this is one view of one of the soldiers. And these are not guys who just sort of you know, hang around you know, doing nothing. These are, they're very diligent, and they're always looking around. I actually had a conversation 
with one of these soldiers in the town of Orvieto. And, uh, you know, I was asking them questions about, you know, and they're, they're there to try to um, prevent uh, terrorism. And uh, this is one of the soldiers in, uh, outside the cathedral. There's a, a back view, a rear view of one of them who was like right in the middle of the crowd to give reassurance to the people that there is, uh, you know, somebody watching over them. So this is something I'd never seen before in Italy. I've, I've seen horses, horse-drawn carriages in Italy, but I've never seen a horse actually eating. And this is a photograph that, that I took of a horse um, having their meal before they you know, took people on a tour of Florence. All these things I've seen for the first time. This was an unusual sight. Um, although Florence was literally crawling with people, this was an empty street. And this is something you very rarely see in Florence at that time of the year. And, you know, as soon as I, and I was, I was actually, Laura and I separate one, one day on our trip. She goes off where she wants to go, I go off where I want to go, and we just kind of, you know, do our own thing that day. And this is, I was just walking down, I was trying to find streets that were deserted. And this is one of the streets I found, and I photographed it. And, you know, it's amazing, you know, to come across um, a place which is actually completely devoid of people. I learned a new word in Italy, in Italian. The word is bambaniere, and this is what that is. It's, it's a party favor, and when Chiaro was making uh, the arrangements for Jacopo's first communion, she was giving party favors to uh, the people that came to the, um, you know, after the communion, they have a little get together. So she was making these, and um, this is, actually I think it's a banban, banban yera. And the plural is banbaniere, with the e at the end of the word. So this is, you know, basically a party favor. And this is something else, of course, that I learned, which was, you know, very fascinating. So um, that was very unique as well. And now we go to tonight's show, which is uh, my favorite bridges. So I, w I may need my reading glasses here, because even though I have now incredibly superb distance vision, I have very, very poor vision up close. I'll try to read this, but if not, I'm going to have to put on my reading glasses. So we start in Florence. And you know, there's no better place for me to start talking about some of my favorite bridges than in my favorite place in the world to go, and that's the city of Florence. And right there in the foreground, you could see the Arno River. This is a magnificent view of the Arno um, that I took off the internet at sunset. And, um, you know, it's just a, a view of some of the famous bridges Right there in the, you know, the predominant bridge you could see there is the Ponte Vecchio, and that's the bridge we're actually going to begin with. So the Ponte Vecchio, here we go, was created for the first time during Roman times. So when this bridge was actually made, which was for the first time in the year 996, it used the exact spot where there was a Roman bridge a thousand years earlier. They found the remnants of that bridge. But the Ponte Vecchio that we're looking at now was built in the year 996. It was destroyed by floods in the year 1117, rebuilt, built in 1333, um, again destroyed uh, by floods. You know, it was built right after 1117, then destroyed by floods again in 1333. Um, and then was actually not destroyed, but partially damaged in the very famous flood in Florence in 1964, where a lot of the water that um, came up very, very high. Luca remembers it and was, was, you know, talks about it a little bit, but it destroyed some of the very, very famous art at the Uffizi. And the Uffizi, you know, in this photograph, you could see the Ponte Vecchio, the Vasari Corridor, which is the 
passageway that the Medicis used to use to get from uh, Old to Arno, which is the southern part of the river, to the northern part, and it went all the way around here into the Uffizi, which were their offices. And this photograph, of course, I've said many times, was taken from the Uffizi. And this is another view of the uh, Ponte Vecchio looking towards the west, and all some of the other bridges, the bridge that comes after it is the Santa Trinita Bridge, um, which was built in the 16th century. The next bridge is the Alla Caraia Bridge, which is the second oldest bridge in Florence, built in the 13th century. The bridge after that is the newest bridge, which is the Amerigo Vespucci Bridge. Here's another view of the Ponte Vecchio. And that's actually walking on the Ponte Vecchio, which is traffic free, a pedestrian only walkway with the famous jewelry stores that I've spoken about many times. This is a view taken of the Arno looking east. Let me make sure that I'm right about that. Okay, to the right is south, so that would be. Um, well, actually, I think that's to the west. Let me see. If you're, if you're on the south side going north, no, that's, if you're south going north, that side would be to the east. So that's towards Pisa. And this photograph is actually taken from the roof of the West in Excelsior, right on the Arno in Florence. This is the Amerigo Vespucci Bridge. Another view, some of my favorite, you know, places to, uh, to get magnificent views of Florence. This is the Devil's Bridge. And uh, it's located in the uh, northwestern town of Borgo a uh, Molzano uh, in an area known as the Alpi Apuane. And it's a magnificent bridge, but it's not the only Devil's Bridge in the world. There are actually 10 bridges that go under the name of the Devil's Bridge. There's one in Bulgaria, uh, there's one in Portugal, and one in Germany, and Switzerland, and Spain. There's actually one in Arizona in the United States. So there's a lot of Devil's Bridges, and this is one of my favorites. The, actually, the only one I've ever seen in, uh, in northwestern Tuscany. This is the bridge that goes uh, from the outside to the town itself in the Tuscan town of Loro Cefena. I don't know the name of this bridge. I looked it up on the internet, but could not get the name. But this is a really beautiful bridge in a really beautiful town in, uh, in the Valdarno area of Tuscany. And then we go to Rome, that's the Colosseum. And this is a bridge which is known as the Pons Amelias, which is the oldest stone bridge in Rome, it was preceded by a wooden bridge and then was rebuilt in the second century. And you can see that it's in ruin. And that's why it has the current name of the Ponto Rotto, which literally means the rotting bridge. And you can see that it's in pretty bad disrepair, but it's a very interesting bridge. And um, that's another view of it, what it looks like. There's actually a newer bridge right next to it. So if you want to get a really beautiful view of the Ponte, Ponte Rotto, you walk along the bridge on the right side, and you get to see uh, a very nice view of that bridge that I just mentioned. I'm trying to get rid of that on top. That's hard without getting that other thing on there. And this is another one of the bridges in, um, in Rome. I don't, I, I don't know the name of this bridge. I'm trying to, I, I can't get rid of it. Oh, there it goes. OK, good. One of the bridges that goes from one side of the Tiber River to the other. And then we come to Venice, which of course has a plethora of bridges. And the most famous bridge in all of uh, Venice, perhaps in all of the world, 
is the Rialto Bridge that spans the Grand Canal. It's the oldest bridge in Venice. Um, it was actually originally built as a wooden bridge in the year 1181. And of course, it um, burned down and was rebuilt in 1255 and was finally built in the current form that it looks today by a fellow by the name of Antonio da Ponte, which literally means um, Anthony of the Bridge. And it was built um, between the years 1591 and 16, 1600. Um, and it's the most famous bridge, certainly in Venice. It's a beautiful bridge. There's another really nice view of it from the uh, um, other side with all the gondolas lined up along the side and the Vaporetto stop, as you can see over there on the right side with the motorboats coming through it. This is the Bridge of Size, S-I-G-S-I-G-H-S, -S -S, Bridge of Size, like, ah, that's, that's a sigh. And the reason it's called the Bridge of Sighs is because it connects the uh, Doge's palace, which, um, where the Doge lived, and also where the trials used to take place of criminals. And then if they were found guilty, they were marched across the bridge to the left into the prison. So the Doge's palace is on the right where the court was, and on the left side is the prison and the prisoners used to look out of those windows at one last view of Venice. And of course, as they went across, they would sigh. And that's why it's called the Bridge of Sighs. This is the Academia Bridge, which was built in the year 1854. It connects the um, uh, section of Venice known as Dorso Duro with the opposite side known as um, um, San Marco, unbelievable. I've, I've only spent like you know most of my life, the past 25 years, on the Piazza San Marco, and that area of Venice is actually called San Marco. So it connects San Marco with Dorso Duro, and there's a beautiful view of it that uh, Laura took in the you know as the sun was going down with a Vaporetto or water bus coming over there in the background. And you could see that it, um, oh, this is actually the Scalzi Bridge. So this is the bridge that connects the train station with the opposite side of the train station, an area known as uh, San Polo. And there you can see the Vaporetto stops. And, and you know, un under the bridge right over here, is where the, is the train station. So this is the Scalzi Bridge, named after a nearby church. And that's another view of it. With the people going back and forth to the train station. This is the newest, incidentally the Scalzi Bridge was built in 1934. This is the newest bridge of all the bridges in uh, Venice called the Calatrava Bridge, and it was built by uh, an architect by the name of Calatrava. And I love this photograph. We did not take this. This photograph was taken by me off the internet, but it shows you what Venice looks like after or during a snowstorm, which is very, very unusual. I've been to Venice in the winter a couple of times. I've never seen snow. I've seen a few floods from the uh, Aqua Alta um, situation, which means the high tide. But this is a view of Venice, with, which is, you know, a, a very, very, it looks like a very, very slim covering of snow. But this is what it looks like when it's really cold. You can see the people bundled up going across the Calatrava Bridge, which connects the Piazzale Roma with, uh, where the, um, with, with, the, with the piazza where the train station is located. And this is another of my favorite bridges in uh, Venice. This is actually a video of me carrying luggage across the San Travasso Bridge 
to get to the, the, our favorite hotel at the time, which was the Pensione Academia. So Ellen, when you're ready. Okay, here the we go. The bridge to the hotel. And Hello. this is me. And you know, Laura, of course, is taking the video. So I'm the one responsible for literally carrying all of our luggage across the San Travasso Bridge. That's me right there. And I know that this was taken in the year 2007 because what I'm doing now is pointing out where friends of ours were staying. And you walk down this narrow walkway. That's a famous restaurant that we go to. And there's me walking down this uh, walkway to the Hotel Pensione Academia, carrying all the luggage. I just thought I'd throw that in for fun because I wanted to see that. And that's the other side of the San Travasso Canal. And we're headed in through the front door, the front gate, I should say, of the Pensione Academia. I'm turning around now to tell Laura that here we are uh, for the I don't know how many of time, but it's a beautiful entrance to the uh, hotel, as you can see. And we'll stop right there, because I have a few more photographs of some other of my favorite bridges. That's another view of the, uh, the San Travasso Bridge from the opposite angle. And these are just some random bridges that we took over the many, many years that we spent in Venice. And you know, Venice is a beautiful, um, a beautiful city with really spectacular, charming looking bridges. My favorite bridges of all my travels This is actually a bridge that's not in Venice, but in the neighboring island of Murano. You know, these hundreds of year old canals with bridges, many of them, you know, that we travel, we, we, we try to go to some of the more um, obscure locations in, in Venice, so you can see that most of the bridges are pretty devoid of people because we always try to go away from the tourists. This is actually on the Grand Canal. And that brings us to the end of tonight's show. The next show that I'm going to be doing will begin the new season, so to speak, where I use material that we photographed uh, and researched during our most recent trip. So the next show is going to be Return to Civita di Bonareggio, and that'll be very, very interesting uh, for you to see. And that brings us to the end. How do I get back? Now I forgot. Oh, I think I do this. You see, you forget after all this time. So, wait a minute. So, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you tune in for all the new shows that we're going to be doing in the future. And for tonight, buona notte e buona fortuna.